We have this urban legend in my city called the Wrong Way Man. Supposedly, you might see him standing on the side of the road when you're driving. Some say it's always when you're on your way home. I've seen pictures of the Wrong Way Man. They circulate among us by text message. They circulate among students, workers, friends, and family here. Oddly, I've never seen any of those pictures posted online. I'm not sure if it's because of fear, because those who have taken the pictures want to perpetrate the mystique of our local urban legend, or because of something else. I was pretty sure those pictures had been a hoax, just someone dressed up as the wrong way man. Maybe it was the same person every time. As far as what the wrong way man looks like, he wears his tattered clothing backwards, usually a flannel shirt and jeans. His painted, smiling face looks eerily realistic until he turns to the side and you can see it's a smooth surface. It seems that he shaves off his hair, paints a face over the back of his head, and puts a shoulder length wig on that covers up his real face. Those who I've met who have claimed to have spotted the wrong way man say that they waited a week before driving home, staying over a friend's house or a hotel and not even bothering to go home to pack a suitcase. I've also heard though that you need to wait a month. The common consensus seems to be, if you see him while driving home, don't finish the drive, turn around, go somewhere else and wait for at least a week. I thought it was a bunch of nonsense, until my date and I saw the wrong way man when we were going back to my house from the movies. It was Katie who spotted him. Slow down, she said. I think I see that wrong way man you told me about. Katie had only lived in my city for half a year, so one of the things I had told her on my quest to share with her as many interesting things as I could had been our local legend about the wrong way man. Was it coincidence that we had just been talking about him a few days before? I had never seen someone dressed as the wrong way man in person. Pictures, sure, but never in person. My foot was shaking as I eased up on the gas. It was dark, nearing midnight dark and there were either no street lights or they were off. My car's headlights lit him up. On the side of the road, he was facing us. Actually, he had his back to us. That painted face was facing us. The jeans and flannel shirt and wig were all turned our way as well. His arms and legs looked wrong. They were shoved down in his clothing the opposite way. I wanted to be amused. But I was alarmed. When we got about 10 feet away in my car, he turned his painted head towards us. Those painted eyes, realistic but forever held too wide, seemed to be staring right into mine. As we drove slowly by, I waved to him and laughed, trying to ease some of the tension. He did not wave back. I looked at Katie. She was waving too, but she wasn't laughing. I glanced back just in time to see the slick side of that person's shaved, painted head, and the optical illusion of a real face being there was shattered. Shattered, but somehow worse for it. Also, when I peered into the rearview mirror as we increased our distance, I thought I saw something glinting beneath the shoulder-length wig he wore. Then he was gone, lost to the darkness. I picked up speed. He hadn't been walking, but somehow, I was worried he would come after us too quickly. So, what do we do now? Katie said. We can't go to your home, or mine. I glanced at her, and soon we both started laughing. 
Well, I said, after tonight we'll be able to tell everyone around that we saw the wrong way man and went immediately home. I wonder who was pretending to be the wrong way man, Katie said. I wonder why they were doing it. Do you think we should turn back around and try to talk to them? I'd rather we didn't, I said. They could be dangerous, but I'm sure it's just someone looking to keep the urban legend alive. It's your car, Katie said. But if it were mine... All right, I said. We'll turn back around. My grandpa used to say, if you're in doubt which turn to make, you can always take a U-turn until you figure things out. He used that as a metaphor for life. But as I did my U-turn, my heart was thrashing in my chest. We drove down the entirety of that dark street without seeing that person again. It was a couple of miles long in that direction, so there's no way they could have walked or run the distance so quickly. Katie and I decided that the person dressed as the wrong way man must have left the shoulder of the road for the surrounding woods. The idea of them hiding in the woods as we drove by again made me feel like I had spiders crawling over my flesh. We did another U-turn, and during that whole time, I kept glancing around in case the person jumped at us from out of nowhere, but soon we were headed back in the direction of my house with no second look at the wrong way man. Katie and I tried to laugh it out, and we tried to talk about other things, but both of us were pretty scared. We couldn't stop chatting about everything and nothing, or glancing out the windows or into our side mirrors. We turned into my subdivision, then we turned onto my street, and everything changed. As soon as we turned onto my street, we started to go backwards instead of forwards. Did you put it in reverse? Katie said. Her hand was gripping my arm. It was as cold as ice. I stopped the car. Both of us were looking down. The car was in drive. I took my foot off the brake and put it on to the gas pedal. The houses, familiar houses I saw every day when coming home, were moving away from us. Maybe something's wrong with my car, I said. But when I tried driving forward again, I looked to the side and then in the rearview mirror. We were not moving, not according to those views. In front of us, the houses receded every time I put my foot on the gas, but from the side and rear, it appeared that we were standing still. On my street, everything was well lit. There were tons of streetlights, so we couldn't argue it away as if it had anything to do with limited visibility. Let's get out of here, Katie said. Her voice was almost a whisper. Yeah, I said in a similar way. But how are we going to leave? Put it in reverse. When I put my car in reverse and tried that, we actually moved forward. But to the side and rear, once again, we seemed to have not moved, like we were caught just past the entrance to my neighborhood. It was when Katie and I had stopped the car and were debating getting out that we spotted someone coming towards us on the sidewalk. They were approaching us from the front of the vehicle, so I'm not sure how accurate the distance was. It seemed like they were already about 20 feet away. I don't know why it took me so long to realize this. Maybe it was because I didn't want to, but I recognized my neighbor by the back of his head and his body shape which was somewhat atypical. I'd seen him often stooped, working in his garden while I was driving by. He was walking backwards towards us. When he got closer, he stopped. Then he began shouting, over and over again, standing stock still, his back to us. Only later would I realize he had been saying help me in reverse. I rolled down the window. Mr. Nelson, I said. What's the matter? He stopped shouting. Now that my window was down, 
I could hear his body creak and snap. Blood poured out of his fissures as his joints of his arms and legs changed drastically. When Mr. Nelson's head twisted all the way around towards us, I was sure that I saw the light go out of his eyes. Then, whatever had taken Mr. Nelson made a first step forward with the new architecture of his body. Katie and I both began to scream at the first step. I rolled up the window as Mr. Nelson lopped around on strange, inhuman legs. His kneecaps and elbows had become stretched and exaggerated from being in reverse. I put my foot on the gas, with the car still in reverse, and through the front windows we seemed to be careening forward, even though a glance out the sides or the rear view showed us to still be stationary. We slammed into Mr. Nelson. Blood slashed across the windshield. The car rose and fell as we went over his body. To the sides and the rear, there were no indication of the car rising and falling. I did not see a lump appear behind us. I kept my foot on the gas, still going forward in reverse. I saw a window of a neighbor's house shatter. A couple I barely recognized crawled out like baby spiders out of eggs, leaking blood and more blood as they scraped themselves against the shards in the window frame. I don't think it was that they didn't know how to open windows. When the wife paused in the window, she smiled. She intentionally rubbed her scalp against a particularly sharp looking piece of glass. Meat and blood came away. I think I could see the white of her skull. By then, her husband was already on the ground, running towards us. I sped forward. They and their house vanished in the sides and the rear of the vehicle, which were, again, still stuck near the street's entrance. More people were coming out of their homes. They came out all twisted and broken, damaging themselves further as they exited. They ran towards us on backward legs, churning their backward arms. Everything about them was the wrong way. Before long, I found myself slamming on the brakes. Keep going, Katie yelled. They're going to catch up with us. Ahead, I saw my own driveway. Someone that looked like me was talking to another person with a painted face. The painted face nodded. Up and down it nodded like a real face would do. Then, when I saw the wig shuffle and move seemingly on its own, I realized that the true face under that wig was talking moving its lips, breathing. The wrong way man was talking to me, or someone who looked like me. At the same time, Katie was reaching over me, trying desperately to put her foot on the gas. A couple of twisted pieces of bone and meat collided with the windshield. Two faces with bunched up folds of neck leered at me through glazed eyes. These were faces I should have recognized. Their twisted arms continued to beat at the window, even though their eyes told me that no one was home. A spider's web of cracks spread across the windshield. Its grooves caught blood. I slammed my foot on the gas while helping to steady Katie back into her seat. We flung those two off, and right after, we ran over an entire family in quick succession. I didn't have time to feel guilty. These were not my neighbors. These were not my neighbors. These, These were not, were not my. Katie and I both began to change. I heard some of my bones break. I felt it a moment later, like the reverse of lightning before thunder. Katie and I started screaming, almost in unison, and about the same tune. It was like a choir of pain and fear. Fear and pain had risen up with us his instruments. Keep your head back, I yelled as I strove to keep my head pinned against my seat. Don't let it twist around. No matter what happens to the rest of our bodies, we can't let it kill us. I know, Katie said. Just get this car out of here. Make a U-turn or something. Make a U-turn, I thought. What was it that Grandpa always said about life? and how if you didn't know what to do, 
you can always make a U-turn. Still in reverse, yet still going forward, I wheeled the car screeching around. I didn't glance out the sides or the rear. I gunned it, heading back towards where we'd come from. The wrong way man waited. He waited for me at the juncture of my driveway in the street. His painted mouth grinned forever. His painted eyes were too wide and incapable of blinking. We passed him and drove out of the neighborhood. Katie and I weren't out of the woods, though. I was able to get us to a nearby gas station before my legs and arms, which were partway reversed and leaking blood, completely gave out. We crawled out of the vehicle and onto the cold, hard concrete of the gas station. I blacked out almost at once, but Katie tells me she retained consciousness until the ambulance arrived. I don't envy her. We spent months in the hospital with broken bones and torn ligaments and muscles. I think the only thing that saved us permanent damage might have been the seats of our vehicles resisting our change. We told the doctors we had been in a car accident. They shook their heads at us and kept asking questions. I did go back home eventually. We both did. The reason I went home was because one of my neighbors that we had run over with the car came to the hospital to visit me. They seemed completely fine, as if nothing had happened and the wrong way man had never changed them. Damage was done to my vehicle and to Katie and me, both physically and psychologically. And while our bodies are on the mend, I don't think we'll ever be the same. I feel the wrong way inside.